Five Live Breakfast. Rachel Burden and Rick Edwards. Good morning, Rick and Rachel with you. Five Live Breakfast, Tuesday the 22nd of March. Let's get the latest on Ukraine. Uh, as you're just hearing in the news, US President Joe Biden says the Russian leader Vladimir Putin could be preparing to use chemical and biological weapons against Ukraine because he has his back against the wall. He's asserting that we, America, have biological as well as chemical weapons in Europe. Simply not true. I guarantee you. They're also suggesting that Ukraine has biological and chemical weapons in Ukraine. That's a clear sign he's considering using both of those. He's already used chemical weapons in the past, and we should be careful what about to, what's about to come. Ukraine says a further 8,000 people were evacuated from conflict zones on Monday. Deputy Prime Minister Irina Verishchuk said this included around 3,000 people from Mariupol. Earlier we heard from 27-year-old Victoria who managed to get out of Mariupol. Spoke to us from a village about 20 kilometres away. It's a really powerful interview, but it, it is upsetting. My city is absolutely destroyed. Me, my family, all our friends. We don't have our homes now. All the buildings are destroyed and the shelling is continuing now. I can hear, I, I am from uh, far from 20 kilometers from Mariupol, but every day is audible to hear shelling of my city. How are people surviving? How are they getting things like food and water? People stay in the basement, um, but it doesn't save too. Uh, the bombing are uh, so hard, so they destroy even these basements. They don't have water. We gathered snow several uh, several days ago uh, ago for have for having some water, uh, you know. And uh, there are more than three hundred thousand people are still in Mariupol. They don't have food. They don't have water. Children, three children. I know, I know it. Uh, it's really, it's really true. Three children uh, died from dehydration. You know, in the twenty-first century, children are dying from dehydration in my in my city. They are starving now. You have had to leave some family behind. I think. Tell us who is still in the city. And, and how it was to have to leave them? Uh, yeah, just a uh, part of my family are still there and families of my friends, they are still there. Uh, there. Um, um, we tried to took them out of the city, but the city uh, is closed. Um, they don't let, let in. Uh, so we couldn't take them out, uh, to take them out from the sea, from the Mariupol now. What will you do next? Will you try to move further away from Mariupol? Will you try to maybe even leave Ukraine? No, I will stay in Ukraine. I will try to save my family from Mariupol. I want to. I want to believe my um, my city will be renovated. I don't want to leave my home. It's my life. I don't understand why I should leave my city, my country, because of, because of something uh, strange, because of, I, because of Russian forces. I don't understand why I should leave my home. It's my home. Before we say goodbye to her, Rick, when we spoke to her earlier on, um, and she said, look, she, she really wants us to be talking about this because mm. obviously we're aware it's very distressing for her to talk about what's going on and what she's experienced, but she's absolutely adamant that the world needs to know 
what's yeah. happening in Mariupol. Um, Anne says this on Twitter. I heard Victoria, the voice of Ukraine, heartbreaking, wavering voice. But she says, it is my country. I am in awe of such strong people, men, women, young, old. Please support them in whatever way we can. And she's only about 20 kilometres from the city itself. She said she could hear the shelling. She can see the fire from the city. Um, so she is well aware of what's going on there and all those people that for the moment she's left behind, but she wants to stay to try to help if she can. It's a desperate, desperate situation. Uh, we can speak now to Dr Vlad Miknenko, who's an economic geographer at the University of Oxford, uh, of Oxford and he has family in, in Mariupol. Morning, Vlad. Morning. Hello. W- were, you, were you listening to Victoria then? I've been listening and it's, uh, it's absolutely horrific uh, mm. and, and really difficult to to listen to. I have uh, five uh, members of my family, my my mother's cousins, uh, Oleh and Valera, their mother Maya, and their children, Volodya and Svetlana, in Mariupol. Uh, the last time we were able to speak to them was on day four of the invasion. That was 28th of February. Mm. They had still electricity and the city was still not encircled, not under siege. And they were already sitting in the basement back then in very um, difficult conditions. I cannot imagine what has happened in the following three weeks. Uh, As we know now that 90% of the buildings are damaged or destroyed. If you are in the basement and your nine-story block of flat is hit and it collapses, I'm afraid it will be very difficult to get out of the basement. And we know that uh, those places in which there have been some international exposure, like the the Russian drama theater that was bombed last Mm. week, out of 1,300 people, only 130 came out. So uh, it is very difficult to hear uh, the stories of the uh, survivors of the siege. And uh, yesterday I have uh, been listening to the former governor of the Donetsk region, Siri Taruta, who has half of his family in Mariupol. And uh, his estimates were, you know, 40,000 probably dead. Uh, and nobody is counting because nobody can clear the rubble. Mm. People effectively are under, under the under the rubble, and probably if the Russians take over, then we will never know the exact number of of, of, of civilian death. Are you able to stay at all optimistic about your family's situation? It's difficult to stay optimistic. Uh, we know that, or at least I understand the, the military strategy of the urban warfare of the Russian playbook is to keep as many civilians in sight the city, mm. uh, for the civilians, of course, gets in the way of the defenders. Uh, and of course, they consume food, water, fuel, medicine, all, all the resources. Um, so by now, of course, that is already probably not really the case, given that civilians are not getting in the way. They're already in the basements and they're hiding. Mm. Uh, but, you know, we're looking at 3,000, the latest estimate, 3,000 U- Ukrainian Marines, National Guardsmen and, and Border Guardsmen versus around 14,000 Russian forces that encircle it encircle the city from all the four sides. Um, I presume, you know, the military has been planning to defend the city for eight years, and that is probably the case Mm. that it's holding up for 26 days now. Um, But of course, there is as many, uh, you know, Russian trophies that they can, and ammunition they can can capture and and reuse. Do do you think that that there is an argument for surrendering? I think it's not for us to decide. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we are not in Mariupol and, and the people in Mariupol are, you know, other people who have that agency. Uh, I absolutely convinced that the Ukrainian military is not going to give up uh, and is not going to surrender the city. Uh, whether the Russians will allow the, you know, the remaining civilians to escape, that is a very, very... Uh, it, it, Good question, and I think we need to put as much pressure as we can on the Russian military command, on the Ministry of Defence in particular, mm. uh, for allowing that to happen. And we heard that uh, three thousand people w- were able to leave Mariupol in the, in, the, in the last day or so, I think. Yes, people counting the cars that left in the last mm. last week. I think uh, we can we can probably optimistically say that maybe forty thousand escaped out of 300,000 that were still there, 40,000 escaped, up to 40,000 potentially dead. Uh, so there's quite an enormous amount of people still there. Mm. What, what's, the, what's the end game here? How, how do you see this whole conflict coming to an end? 
I think that uh, given the the strengths of the Western resolve and the amount of sanctions, both public sanctions by, by Western governments, as well as private corporations pulling out of Russia, uh, the frozen assets of the Russian sovereign wealth fund, the restrictions on SWIFT and dollar and euro, and, and euro transactions will eventually lead to the collapse of the Russian economy. So I think that as long as Ukraine holds, hangs on for a few more weeks, uh, the, the losses that the Russian army are encountering, and we know now, you know, they're looking at about 17,000 dead. That is about, well above and beyond the, the nine, nine years of war in Afghanistan. So I think they just run out of, they will run out of steam. They will run out of, of effectively cotton fodder, and, and they will have to stall. And then there will be a negotiation of a different kind that is now. How long do you think that will take? Uh, I think the most conservative estimate, I would say, is early May. Mm-hmm. I think the most optimistic uh, estimate I would give you is two weeks. Mm. Is there anything else that you'd like to see the rest of Europe and the rest of the world doing to help? I think we need to understand that uh, the Russian uh, the Russian Federation, the, the, the Russian regime is a colossus on clay legs, and we need to push it over. It should be a sharp, short action. Yes, I know that oil and gas embargo as a, a, a horrific in terms of the cost for our consumers and myself including but what we need to understand if if we stop buying russian oil and gas now it's not going to be forever we can just need to do it for a couple you know for a month mm. and by that time there definitely be another leader in moscow who probably will be more rational and more prone to negotiation so i would say harder sanctions and of course the provision of, of heavier uh, anti-aircraft uh, anti-aircraft defense for Ukraine because Mariupol is bombarded by 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 air, mm. so they are still they're able to use uh, jet the bombers uh, because there is no air defense in the vicinity, and so a longer range air defense would help Mariupol uh, from at least aerial bombardment. The five you know half ton bombs that that hit the the drama theater, the swimming pool full of women, the the maternity ward, all of those things could 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 be ended by effective air defense. So I think heavy armaments and harder, harder sanctions, this is, we need to understand that, yes, although, although it, this is a war of attrition, I think uh, the Russia hasn't got a lot of sort of fat in the system uh, to, to run forever. So that, 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 I, would, that I, would, I would advise, sharp, sharp, short action now. Thanks very much for speaking to us this morning and for, for all your thoughts, Vlad. That's Dr. Vlad McNenko, uh, economic geographer at the University of Oxford, but has, as he was saying, um, five members of his family in Mariupol who he's not heard from in several weeks. Uh, no idea what their situation might be. It's 18 minutes past eight. One of the other big things.